Hello, everyone, and welcome to Asian Viewpoints with Mary Sit. Today, our guest is a celebrated author who combines decades of culinary experience with on-the-ground research and has produced a fantastic new book. Fuchsia Dunlop is the James Beard award-winning author of Invitation to a Banquet, the Story of Chinese Food. Thank you so much for being with us, Fuchsia. Great to be here. Thanks, Mary. I loved your book. Um, Really fascinating reading a lot of history and written in a very interesting, bright way, not the dull history book like in school. Um, You call yourself a Chinese food snob. And you say that Chinese cuisine is absolutely the best of any other kind of cuisine. Can you tell me why you feel like that? Oh, so many reasons. I mean, Chinese cuisine is so diverse, you could never get bored with it. Um, you know, even within one region, there's so many snacks and dishes. But the country as a whole, you've got all the sort of noodle country, bread, wheat country in the north. Um, and then in the south, fantastic fresh vegetables and seafood, the spicy flavors of Sichuan. There's so much there. But for me, the really the best thing about Chinese food is that ideas about health, and good living are totally bound up with the pleasure of eating and have been for more than 2,000 years. And I think Chinese is a cuisine where you can combine utter deliciousness and real sort of indulgence in the delights, the sensory delights of eating with just feeling good if you know how to eat properly with balancing your body because Chinese food, you know, there are many rich dishes like Mm -hmm dark or red braised pork but there are also so many light nourishing broths sparklingly fresh vegetables so that for me is the real greatness of Chinese cuisine. How has Chinese gotten a bad rap over the years? I know in your book you talk about if the French had done this or the Danish or whatever you know we go oh wow but when the Chinese do it it's like what's in there can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah well I think that western perceptions of Chinese food were created from really the takeout experience. You know, Cantonese immigrants to America and other countries came up with a formula that was wildly successful of making inexpensive, really tasty food. Um, Mm -hmm. They were often, you know, not living in Chinese communities, but in small towns, catering Mm -hmm. for non-Chinese tastes. And the food was very much adapted Um, And we all know this takeout style of food, which is lacking all these light soups and, Mm -hmm. you know, nice vegetables and things. And I think also that, um, you know, Chinese food has been stuck in that kind of inexpensive everyday bracket. Um, And people don't realize that China has this extremely grand and ancient cuisine. And sure, it has sort of, you know, cheap street food, but it also has extremely extravagant, time-consuming, intellectually exciting banquet cookery. So I think that perceptions have been cha- have been shaped by this, you know, very one aspect, you know, based on one regional cuisine, because most of the immigrants, the early immigrants to America were Cantonese. And I think also there's just you know, a bit of a dose of prejudice, you know, from Mm -hmm. the early days that um, Chinese laborers faced all kinds of discrimination. And I think that's really endured a bit in ideas that Chinese food is weird or and so on, which is all very unfair. You come not just from an academic uh, perspective, but you actually lived in China, you know, Mandarin fluently. Tell me about your early years in China and how you, you know, how long you lived there and what you learned during those years. So so I went to China to live in 1994 as a student on a scholarship at, um, at Sichuan University in Chengdu, which is the capital of Sichuan province. And um, I was already a very keen cook. I loved cooking from early childhood and eating. <laughs> in Sichuan, I was just surrounded by this fantastically exciting cuisine, which was so extremely different from the kind of Chinese food that I'd known growing up in England in the sort of 1970s and 80s. <laughs> and um, and I was curious. And as someone who loved to cook, I started informally learning you know from Chinese friends that I was making and also um, asking restaurants around the university if I could go into the kitchen their kitchen to study Mm -hmm. and they often said yes so I started like that and then took some private classes at this famous chef school Uh and after I finished at the university my teachers at this chef school the Sichuan High Institute of Cuisine invited me to enroll on a professional chef's training course 
And so I said yes immediately. And I spent the next few months in a class of 50 young Sichuanese men and just. <laughs> were you the first foreigner to be invited at that level? I bet you were. Foreigner to study there. Yeah. yeah. And so I had this fantastic training in the mm -hmm. basics of Sichuanese food, the classic dishes, and also the knife work and mm -hmm. the use of a wok and all these skills which actually relate to Chinese cuisine more broadly, not just Sichuanese. And that was just the beginning. So that's nearly 30 years ago. And ever since then, I've been spending a lot of time in China, um, talking to people about food, traveling, and more than anything, eating. <laughs> when I was a young teenager, I made quiche Lorraine, and I was so proud of myself for the family meal, right? I bring it to the table. My father looks at it and goes, where's the rice? Yes. I was so upset, Fuchsia. I was like furious, at, just really upset. My mom looks at me and goes, honey, a meal is not a meal without rice. Exactly what your book said. So tell me why is rice such an important element? And it's not just a filler, right? It, it has something to do with the flavors of what else you're serving. Tell me about that. Well, I think it's just the heart of the meal. You know, in Chinese, to eat a meal is shu fan. And right. that really means eat your cooked grain. I mean, usually rice in the south, and it could also be millet or wheat in the north. Uh -huh. um, and really, a Chinese meal is to eat your rice, your staple grain, and everything else, all the dishes. The intention is to xia fan, to send the rice down. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> to flavor the rice. Uh-huh. Of course, you know, even at an everyday meal in China, you may have several dishes to eat with your rice. Uh -huh. And at a banquet, you might have dozens of dishes. Um, and at a banquet, because it's about extravagance, maybe right. the rice will be represented by a tiny little bowl of, of rice or noodles, but uh -huh. it's still there. Um, but yeah, and I think it's the emotional heart of the meal as well. You know, just as you were saying, you know, in your family, without rice, it's not it's just a snack. And I'm going to read one sentence that I came across, just one, about soup. And you wrote, just as a slow candlelit strip tease is more erotic than naked mud wrestling, a strandy soup of shredded fish and bamboo shoots is simply more attractive. Wow. Who wouldn't want to read about that? <laughs> when you're sitting down writing that book, do these images just come to you naturally? Or do you, how does it work when you're writing as a writer? Well, yeah, so I suppose they do just come to me. But I, I very much, I really want to share with people the sensory experience of eating. You know, this is not a dry historical book. It's about no, it's not. Chinese food. And, uh -huh. and I think that, um, yes, I just, I'm always trying to imagine how to explain, how to really communicate, not just the flavor, but also the kogan, the mouthfeel, the mm -hmm. experience of eating. Um, and I think also, you know, as, as the reviewer suggests, I mean, I have a lot of fun with it. I mean, I think right. you a bit mischievous. In <laughs> so this book is divided into different sections. You have a hearth, farm, kitchen and table. And under each section, you have uh, sub chap or sub divisions, chapters about different recipes or techniques. Do you have a favorite recipe or a favorite technique you can talk to us about? Oh, there are so many, but um, there's one dish in the book that I think says, which is not only very delicious, but says a lot about Chinese cuisine, and that's xia zi yu pi. It's braised pomelo pith with shrimp mm. pith. Um, uh -huh. This is a Cantonese dish, and it's one of my favorites. And the thing that is so exceptional is that when you think about pomelo, that giant citrus fruit, the mm -hmm. pith of it is a very unattractive ingredient. You know, it's cottony, tasteless, white, you know, it just right. doesn't look interesting. And yet Cantonese chefs have found a way of soaking it, rinsing it, cooking it in this lavish broth made of chicken and pork and toasted fish. And mm. you end up with a dish that feels so opulent, so luxurious, so delicious. And, and I think this expresses for me the extreme imagination and creativity of Chinese cooking and Chinese kitchen techniques. Isha, how can we elevate our um, standard of eating Chinese food? I mean, you know, all across America, we have those takeout cheap and tasty Chinese Cantonese food. But also, is it getting better in the, in the landscape cuisine in the States and also in England in terms of, you know, what restaurants are cooking these days and how do we find that just the most expensive Chinese restaurant or we, do we make friends with Chinese people and get invited to their homes? What do you suggest? 
Well, I think it's much easier now because, you know, the old school American Chinese food was really tailored for Western tastes. And it was always very different from what people in China were eating and even from what the, the people owning the Chinese takeouts were eating. You know, they'd be eating very different food. Um, and I think what's changed is now there are so many really authentic Chinese restaurants. You've got big Chinese communities and restaurants which are designed for Chinese tastes mm -hmm. and um, a lot more regional diversity. So Sichuanese, for example, is very popular with Chinese customers and now with everyone else too. Right. And so I think that um, it, it's easy for anyone. You know, you can see restaurants that are popular in the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also one thing that's really interesting is that now there's a whole new generation of like American born Chinese people or mm -hmm. Chinese, young Chinese who've been educated in America. They're bilingual mm -hmm. and they have a huge advantage in being able to describe the food and present it and make it more accessible. Well, Fisha, thank you so much for being on the show and talking to us about your wonderful book, Invitation to a Banquet, The Story of Chinese Food. Thank you so much. All right, so glad you enjoyed the book. Go out and get this book, everyone. It's great. So if you enjoyed this interview, please click the like button below and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so before. I'm Mary Sit. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again in the next video. Bye.